Chapter nineteen, twenty, and twenty one of Looking Backward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Looking Backward, two thousand to eighteen eighty seven, by Edward Bellamy. Chapter nineteen. In the course of an early morning constitutional, I visited Charleston. Among the changes, too numerous to attempt to indicate, which marked the lapse of a century in that quarter, I particularly noted the total disappearance of the old state prison. That went before my day, but I remember hearing about it, said Dr. Leed, when I alluded to the fact at the breakfast table. We have no jails nowadays. All cases of atavism are treated in the hospitals. Of atavism? I exclaimed, staring. Why, yes, replied Dr. Leed. The idea of dealing punitively with those unfortunates was given up at least fifty years ago, and I think more. I don't quite understand you, I said. Atavism in my day was a word applied to the cases of persons in whom some trait of a remote ancestor recurred in a noticeable manner. Am I to understand that crime is nowadays looked upon as the recurrence of an ancestral trait? I beg your pardon, said Dr. Leed, with a smile half humorous, half deprecating, but since you have so explicitly asked the question, I am forced to say that the fact is precisely that. After what I had already learned of the moral contrasts between the nineteenth and the twentieth centuries, it was doubtless absurd in me to begin to develop sensitiveness on the subject, and probably, if Dr. Leed had not spoken with that apologetic air, and Mrs. Leed and Edith shown a corresponding embarrassment, I should not have flushed, as I was conscious I did. I, I was not in much danger of being vain of my generation before, I said, but really— "'This is your generation, Mr. West,' interposed Edith. "'It is the one in which you are living, you know, "'and it is only because we are alive now that we call it ours.' "'Thank you. I will try to think of it so,' I said, "'and as my eyes met hers, their expression quite cured my senseless sensitiveness. "'After all,' I said, with a laugh, "'I was brought up a Calvinist, "'and ought not to be startled to hear crime spoken of as an ancestral trade.' "'In point of fact,' said Dr. Leed, "'our use of the word is no reflection at all on your generation, "'if, begging Edith's pardon, we may call it yours, "'so far as seeming to imply that we think ourselves, "'apart from our circumstances, better than you were. "'In your day, fully nineteen-twentieth of the crime, "'using the word broadly to include all sorts of misdemeanors, "'resulted from the inequality in the possessions of individuals. "'Want tempted the poor.' lust of greater gains, or the desire to preserve former gains, tempted the well-to-do. Directly or indirectly, the desire for money, which then meant every good thing, was the motive of all this crime, the taproot of a vast poison growth, which the machinery of law, courts, and police could barely prevent from choking your civilization outright. When we made the nation the sole trustee of the wealth of the people, and guaranteed to all abundant maintenance, on the one hand abolishing want, and on the other checking the accumulation of riches, we cut this root, and the poison tree that overshadowed your society with it, like Jonas Gord, in a day. As for the comparatively small class of violent crimes against persons, unconnected with any idea of gain, they were almost wholly confined, even in your day, to the ignorant and bestial, and in these days, when education and good manners are not the monopoly of a few, but universal, such atrocities are scarcely ever heard of. You now see why the word atavism is used for crime. It is because nearly all forms of crime known to you are motiveless now, and when they appear can only be explained as the outcropping of ancestral trades. You used to call persons who stole, evidently without any rational motive, kleptomaniacs, and when the case was clear deemed it absurd to punish them as thieves. Your attitude toward the genuine kleptomaniac is precisely ours toward the victim of atavism, an attitude of compassion and firm but gentle restraint. "'Your courts must have an easy time of it,' I observed. "'With no private property to speak of, no disputes between citizens over business relations, no real estate to divide or debts to collect, there must be absolutely no civil business at all for them. And with no offences against property, and mighty few of any sort to provide criminal cases, I should think you might almost do without judges and lawyers altogether. We do without the lawyers, certainly, 
was Dr. Leeds' reply. It would not seem reasonable to us, in a case where the only interest of the nation is to find out the truth, that persons should take part in the proceedings who had an acknowledged motive to colour it. But who defends the accused? If he is a criminal, he needs no defence, for he pleads guilty in most instances, replied Dr. Leed. The plea of the accused is not a mere formality with us as with you. It is usually the end of the case. Y you don't mean that the man who pleads not guilty is thereupon discharged? No, I do not mean that. He is not accused on light grounds, and if he denies his guilt, he must still be tried. But trials are few, for in most cases the guilty man pleads guilty. When he makes a false plea, and is clearly proved guilty, his penalty is doubled. Falsehood is, however, so despised among us that few offenders would lie to save themselves. "'That is the most astounding thing you have yet told me,' I exclaimed. "'If lying has gone out of fashion, this is indeed the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness, which the prophet foretold.' Such is, in fact, the belief of some persons nowadays, was the doctor's answer. They hold that we have entered upon the millennium, and the theory from their point of view does not lack plausibility. But as to your astonishment at finding that the world has outgrown lying, there is really no ground for it. Falsehood, even in your day, was not common between gentlemen and ladies, social equals. The lie of fear was the refuge of cowardice, and the lie of fraud the device of the cheat. The inequalities of men and the lust of acquisition offered a constant premium on lying at that time. Yet even then the man who neither feared another nor desired to defraud him scorned falsehood. Because we are now all social equals, and no man either has anything to fear from another or can gain anything by deceiving him, the contempt of falsehood is so universal that it is rarely, as I told you, that even a criminal in other respects will be found willing to lie. When, however, a plea of not guilty is returned, the judge appoints two colleagues to state the opposite sides of the case. How far these men are from being like your hired advocates and prosecutors, determined to acquit or convict, may appear from the fact that unless both agree that the verdict found is just, the case is tried over, while anything like bias in the tone of either of the judges stating the case would be a shocking scandal. "'Do I understand,' I said, "'that it is a judge who states each side of the case as well as a judge who hears it?' "'Certainly. The judges take turns in serving on the bench and at the bar, and are expected to maintain the judicial temper equally whether in stating or deciding a case.' The system is indeed in effect that of trial by three judges occupying different points of view as to the case. When they agree upon a verdict, we believe it to be as near to absolute truth as men well can come. You have given up the jury system, then? It was well enough as a corrective in the days of hired advocates, and a bench sometimes venal, and often with a tenure that made it dependent. But it is needless now. No conceivable motive but justice could actuate our judges." How are these magistrates selected? They are an honourable exception to the rule which discharges all men from service at the age of forty-five. The President of the nation appoints the necessary judges year by year from the class reaching that age. The number appointed is, of course, exceedingly few, and the honour so high that it is held an offset to the additional term of service which follows, and though a judge's appointment may be declined, it rarely is. The term is five years, without eligibility to reappointment. The members of the Supreme Court, which is the guardian of the Constitution, are selected from among the lower judges. When a vacancy in that court occurs, those of the lower judges, whose term expires that year, select, as their last official act, the one of their colleagues left on the bench whom they deem fittest to fill it. There being no legal profession to serve as a school for judges, I said, they must, of course, come directly from the law school to the bench. We have no such things as law schools, replied the doctor, smiling. The law as a special science is obsolete. It was a system of casuistry which the elaborate artificiality of the old order of society absolutely required to interpret it, but only a few of the plainest and simplest legal maxims have any application to the existing state of the world. Everything touching the relations of men to one another is now simpler, beyond any comparison, than in your day. 
we should have no sort of use for the hair-splitting experts who presided and argued in your courts. You must not imagine, however, that we have any disrespect for those ancient worthies, because we have no use for them. On the contrary, we entertain an unfeigned respect, amounting almost to awe, for the men who alone understood and were able to expound the interminable complexity of the rights of property, and the relations of commercial and personal dependence involved in your system. What, indeed, could possibly give a more powerful impression of the intricacy and artificiality of that system, than the fact that it was necessary to set apart from other pursuits the cream of the intellect of every generation, in order to provide a body of pundits able to make it even vaguely intelligible to those whose fates it determined? The treatises of your great lawyers, the works of Blackstone and Chitty, of Storey and Parsons, stand in our museums, side by side with the tomes of Duns Scotus and his fellow scholastics, as curious monuments of intellectual subtlety devoted to subjects equally remote from the interests of modern man. Our judges are simply widely informed, judicious, and discreet men of ripe years. I should not fail to speak of one important function of the minor judges, added Dr. Leet. This is to adjudicate all cases where a private of the industrial army makes a complaint of unfairness against an officer. All such questions are heard and settled, without appeal, by a single judge, three judges being required only in graver cases. The efficiency of industry requires the strictest discipline in the army of labor, but the claim of the workmen to just and considerate treatment is backed by the whole power of the nation. The officer commands, and the private obeys, but no officer is so high that he would dare display an overbearing manner towards a workman of the lowest class. As for churlishness or rudeness by an official of any sort, in his relations to the public, not one among minor offences is more sure of a prompt penalty than this. Not only justice, but civility is enforced by our judges in all sorts of intercourse. No value of service is accepted as a set-off to boorish or offensive manners. It occurred to me, as Dr. Leet was speaking, that in all his talk I had heard much of the nation, and nothing of the state governments. Had the organization of the nation, as an industrial unit, done away with the states? I asked. Necessarily, he replied, the state governments would have interfered with the control and discipline of the industrial army, which, of course, required to be central and uniform. Even if the state governments had not become inconvenient for other reasons, they were rendered superfluous by the prodigious simplification in the task of government since your day. Almost the sole function of the administration now is that of directing the industries of the country. Most of the purposes for which governments formerly existed no longer remain to be subserved. We have no army or navy and no military organization. We have no departments of state or treasury no excise or revenue services, no taxes or tax collectors. The only function proper of government, as known to you, which still remains, is the judiciary and police system. I have already explained to you how simple is our judicial system as compared with your huge and complex machine. Of course, the same absence of crime and temptation to it, which make the duty of judges so light, reduces the number and duties of the police to a minimum but with no state legislators, and Congress meeting only once in five years, how do you get your legislation done? We have no legislation, replied Dr. Leed, that is, next to none. It is rarely that Congress, even when it meets, considers any new laws of consequence, and then it only has power to commend them to the following Congress, lest anything be done hastily. If you will consider a moment, Mr. West, you will see that we have nothing to make laws about. The fundamental principles on which our society is founded settle for all time the strifes and misunderstandings which in your day called for legislation. Fully ninety-nine hundreds of the laws of that time concerned the definition and protection of private property and the relations of buyers and sellers. There is neither private property beyond personal belongings now, nor buying and selling, and therefore the occasion of nearly all the legislation formerly necessary has passed away. Formerly, society was a pyramid poised on its apex. All the gravitations of human nature were constantly tending to topple it over, and it could be maintained upright, or rather up wrong, 
if you will pardon the feeble witticism, by an elaborate system of constantly renewed props and buttresses and guy robes in the form of laws, a central congress and forty state legislators turning out some twenty thousand laws a year could not make new props fast enough to take the place of those which were constantly breaking down or becoming ineffectual through some shifting of the strain. Now society rests on its base, and is in as little need of artificial supports as the everlasting hills. But you have at least municipal governments, besides the one central authority. Certainly, and they have important and extensive functions in looking out for the public comfort and recreation, and the improvement and embellishment of the villages and cities. But having no control over the labour of their people, or means of hiring it, how can they do anything? Every town or city is conceded the right to retain, for its own public works, a certain proportion of the quota of labour its citizens contribute to the nation. This proportion, being assigned it as so much credit, can be applied in any way desired. Chapter 20 That afternoon Edith casually inquired if I had yet revisited the underground chamber in the garden in which I had been found. Not yet, I replied. To be frank, I have shrunk thus far from doing so, lest the visit might revive old associations rather too strongly for my mental equilibrium. Ah, yes, she said, I can imagine that you have done well to stay away. I ought to have thought of that. No, I said, I am glad you spoke of it. The danger, if there was any, existed only during the first day or two. Thanks to you, chiefly and always, I feel my footing now so firm in this new world that if you will go with me to keep the ghosts off, I should really like to visit the place this afternoon. Edith demurred at first, but, finding that I was in earnest, consented to accompany me. The rampart of earth thrown up from the excavation was visible among the trees from the house, and a few steps brought us to the spot. All remained as it was at the point when work was interrupted by the discovery of the tenants of the chamber, save that the door had been opened and the slab from the roof replaced. Descending the sloping sides of the excavation, he went in at the door and stood within the dimly lighted room. Everything was just as I had beheld it last on that evening one hundred and thirteen years previously, just before closing my eyes for that long sleep. I stood for some time silently looking about me. I saw that my companion was furtively regarding me with an expression of odd and sympathetic curiosity. I put out my hand to her, and she placed hers in it, the soft fingers responding with a reassuring pressure to my clasp. Finally, she whispered, "'Had we not better go out now? You must not try yourself too far. Oh, how strange it must be to you!' "'On the contrary,' I replied, "'it does not seem strange. That is the strangest part of it.' "'Not strange?' she echoed. "'Even so,' I replied, "'the emotions with which you evidently credit me, and which I anticipated, would attend this visit. I simply do not feel. I realize all that these surroundings suggest, but without the agitation I expected. You can't be nearly as much surprised at this as I am myself. Ever since that terrible morning when you came to my help, I have tried to avoid thinking of my former life, just as I have avoided coming here for fear of the agitating effects. I am for all the world like a man who has permitted an injured limb to lie motionless, under the impression that it is exquisitely sensitive, and on trying to move it finds that it is paralyzed. Do you mean your memory is gone? Not at all. I remember everything connected with my former life, but with a total lack of keen sensation. I remember it for clearness, as if it had been but a day since then. But my feelings about what I remember are as faint as if to my consciousness, as well as in fact, a hundred years had intervened. Perhaps it is possible to explain this, too. The effect of change in surroundings is like that of lapse of time in making the past seem remote. When I first woke from that trance, my former life appeared as yesterday. But now, since I have learned to know my new surroundings, and to realize the prodigious changes that have transformed the world, I no longer find it hard, but very easy, to realize that I have slept a century. Can you conceive of such a thing as living a hundred years in four days? It really seems to me that I have done just that, and that it is this experience which has given so remote and unreal an appearance to my former life. Can you see how such a thing might be?' 
"'I can conceive it,' replied Edith, meditatively. "'And I think we ought all to be thankful that it is so, "'for it will save you much suffering, I am sure.' "'Imagine,' I said, in an effort to explain, "'as much to myself as to her, "'the strangeness of my mental condition, "'that a man first heard of a bereavement many, many years, "'half a lifetime, perhaps, after the event occurred. "'I fancy his feeling would be perhaps something as mine is. "'When I think of my friends in the world of that former day, "'and the sorrow they must have felt for me, "'it is with a pensive pity, rather than keen anguish, "'as of a sorrow long, long ago ended.' "'You have told us nothing yet of your friends,' said Edith. "'Had you many to mourn you?' "'Thank God I had very few relatives, none nearer than cousins,' I replied. "'But there was one, not a relative, but dearer to me than any kin of blood. "'She had your name. She was to have been my wife soon. Ah, me!' "'Ah, me!' sighed the Edith by my side. "'Think of the heartache she must have had.' Something in the deep feeling of this gentle girl touched a chord in my benumbed heart. My eyes, before so dry, were flooded with the tears that had till now refused to come. When I had regained my composure, I saw that she, too, had been weeping freely. "'God bless your tender heart,' I said. "'Would you like to see her picture?' A small locket with Edith Bartlett's picture, secured about my neck with a gold chain, had lain upon my breast all through that long sleep, and removing this, I opened and gave it to my companion. She took it with eagerness, and after poring long over the sweet face, touched the picture with her lips. "'I know that she was good and lovely enough to well deserve your tears,' she said. "'But remember her heartache was over long ago, and she has been in heaven for nearly a century.' It was indeed so. Whatever her sorrow had once been, for nearly a century she had ceased to weep, and, my sudden passion spent, my own tears dried away. I had loved her very dearly in my other life, but it was a hundred years ago. I do not know, but some may find in this confession evidence of lack of feeling, but I think, perhaps, that none can have had an experience sufficiently like mine to enable them to judge me. As we were about to leave the chamber, my eye rested upon the great iron safe which stood in one corner. Calling my companion's attention to it, I said, "'This was my strong room as well as my sleeping room.' In the safe yonder are several thousand dollars in gold, and any amount of securities. If I had known when I went to sleep that night just how long my nap would be, I should still have thought that the gold was a safe provision for my needs in any country or any century, however distant. That a time would ever come when it would lose its purchasing power, I should have considered the wildest of fancies. Nevertheless, here I wake up to find myself among a people of whom a cartload of gold will not procure a loaf of bread. As might be expected, I did not succeed in impressing Edith that there was anything remarkable in this fact. "'Why in the world should it?' she merely asked. Chapter 21 It had been suggested by Dr. Leith that we should devote the next morning to an inspection of the schools and colleges of the city, with some attempt, on his own part, at an explanation of the educational system of the twentieth century. "'You'll see,' said he, as we set out after breakfast, "'many very important differences between our methods of education and yours. "'But the main difference is that nowadays all persons equally have those opportunities of higher education, "'which in your day only an infinitesimal portion of the population enjoyed. "'We should think we had gained nothing worth speaking of in equalizing the physical comfort of men without this educational equality.' The cost must be very great, I said. If it took half the revenue of the nation, nobody would grudge it, replied Dr. Leet, nor even if it took it all save a bare pittance. But in truth, the expense of educating ten thousand youth is not ten nor five times that of educating one thousand. The principle which makes all operations on a large scale proportionally cheaper than on a small scale holds as to education also. "'College education was terribly expensive in my day,' said I. "'If I have not been misinformed by our historians,' Dr. Leed answered, "'it was not college education, but college dissipation and extravagance which cost so highly. "'The actual expense of your colleges appears to have been very low, "'and would have been far lower if their patronage had been greater. 
The higher education nowadays is as cheap as the lower, as all grades of teachers, like all other workers, receive the same support. We have simply added to the common school system of compulsory education, in vogue in Massachusetts a hundred years ago, a half-dozen higher grades, carrying the youth to the age of twenty-one, and giving him what he used to call the education of a gentleman, instead of turning him loose at fourteen or fifteen with no mental equipment beyond reading, writing, and the multiplication table. Setting aside the actual cost of these additional years of education, I replied, we should not have thought we could afford the loss of time from industrial pursuits. Boys of the poorer classes usually went to work at sixteen or younger, and knew their trade at twenty. We should not concede you any gain even in material product by that plan, Dr. Leith replied. The greater efficiency which education gives to all sorts of labor, except the rudest, makes up in a short period for the time lost in acquiring it. We should also have been afraid, said I, that a high education, while it adapted men to the professions, would set them against manual labor of all sorts. That was the effect of high education in your day, I have read, replied the doctor, and it was no wonder, for manual labor meant association with a rude, coarse, and ignorant class of people. There is no such class now. It was inevitable that such a feeling should exist then, for the further reason that all men receiving a high education were understood to be destined for the professions or for wealthy leisure, and such an education, in one neither rich nor professional, was a proof of disappointed aspirations, an evidence of failure, a badge of inferiority rather than superiority. Nowadays, of course, when the highest education is deemed necessary to fit a man merely to live, without any reference to the sort of work he may do, its possession conveys no such implication. After all, I remarked, no amount of education can cure natural dullness or make up for original mental deficiencies, unless the average natural mental capacity of men is much above its level in my day, a high education must be pretty nearly thrown away on a large element of the population. We used to hold that a certain amount of susceptibility to educational influences is required to make a mind worth cultivating, just as a certain natural fertility in soil is required if it is to repay tilling. Ah, said Dr. Leed, I am glad you used that illustration, for it is just the one I would have chosen to set forth the modern view of education. You say that land so poor that the product will not repay the labor of tilling is not cultivated. Nevertheless, much land that does not begin to repay tilling by its product was cultivated in your day, and is in ours. I refer to gardens, parks, lawns, and, in general, to pieces of land so situated that, were they left to grow up to weeds and briars, they would be eyesores and inconveniences to all about. They are, therefore, tilled, and though their product is little, there is yet no land that, in a wider sense, better repays cultivation. So it is with the men and women with whom we mingle in the relations of society, whose voices are always in our ears, whose behavior in innumerable ways affects our enjoyment who are, in fact, as much conditions of our lives as the air we breathe or any of the physical elements on which we depend. If, indeed, we could not afford to educate everybody, we should choose the coarsest and dullest by nature, rather than the brightest, to receive what education we could give. The naturally refined and intellectual can better dispense with aids to culture than those less fortunate in natural endowments." To borrow a phrase which was often used in your day, we should not consider life worth living if we had to be surrounded by a population of ignorant, boorish, coarse, wholly uncultivated men and women, as was the plight of the few educated in your day. Is a man satisfied, merely because he is perfumed himself, to mingle with a meldorous crowd? Could he take more than a very limited satisfaction, even in a palatial apartment, if the windows on all four sides open into stable-yards. And yet, just that was the situation of those considered most fortunate as to culture and refinement in your day. I know that the poor and ignorant envied the rich and cultured then, but to us the latter, living as they did, surrounded by squalor and brutishness, seem little better off than the former. The cultured man, in your age, was like one up to the neck in a nauseous bog, solacing himself with a smelling bottle. 
You see, perhaps, now how we look at this question of universal high education. No single thing is so important to every man as to have for neighbours intelligent, companionable persons. There is nothing, therefore, which the nation can do for him that will enhance so much his own happiness as to educate his neighbours. When it fails to do so, the value of his own education to him is reduced by half, and many of the tastes he has cultivated are made positive sources of pain. To educate some to the highest degree, and leave the mass wholly uncultivated, as you did, made the gap between them almost like that between different natural species, which have no means of communication. What could be more inhuman than this consequence of a partial enjoyment of education? Its universal and equal enjoyment leaves, indeed, the differences between men as to natural endowments as marked as in a state of nature, but the level of the lowest is vastly raised. Brutishness is eliminated. All have some inkling of the humanities, some appreciation of the things of the mind, and an admiration for the still higher culture they have fallen short of. They have become capable of receiving and imparting, in various degrees, but all in some measure, the pleasures and inspirations of a refined social life. The cultured society of the nineteenth century, what did it consist of but here and there a few microscopic oases in a vast unbroken wilderness? The proportion of individuals capable of intellectual sympathies or refined intercourse to the mass of their contemporaries used to be so infinitesimal as to be in any broad view of humanity scarcely worth mentioning. One generation of the world today represents a greater volume of intellectual life than any five centuries ever did before. There is still another point I should mention in stating the grounds on which nothing less than the universality of the best education could now be tolerated, continued Dr. Leed, and that is, the interest of the coming generation in having educated parents. To put the matter in a nutshell, there are three main grounds on which our educational system rests. First, the right of every man to the completest education the nation can give him on his own account, as necessary to his enjoyment of himself. Second, the right of his fellow citizens to have him educated, as necessary to their enjoyment of his society. Third, the right of the unborn to be guaranteed an intelligent and refined parentage. I shall not describe in detail what I saw in the schools that day. Having taken but slight interest in educational matters in my former life, I could offer few comparisons of interest. Next to the fact of the universality of the higher as well as the lower education, I was most struck with the prominence given to physical culture, and the fact that proficiency in athletic feats and games, as well as in scholarship, had a place in the rating of the youth. The faculty of education, Dr. Lee explained, is held to the same responsibility for the bodies as for the minds of its charges. The highest possible physical as well as mental development of every one is a double object of a curriculum which lasts from the age of six to that of twenty-one. The magnificent health of the young people in the schools impressed me strongly. My previous observations, not only of the notable personal endowments of the family of my host, but of the people I had seen in my walks abroad, had already suggested the idea that there must have been something like a general improvement in the physical standard of the race since my day. And now, as I compared these stalwart young men and fresh, vigorous maidens with the young people I had seen in the schools of the nineteenth century, I was moved to impart my thought to Dr. Leed. He listened with great interest to what I said. "'Your testimony on this point,' he declared, "'is invaluable. We believe that there has been such an improvement as you speak of, but of course it could only be matter of theory with us. It is an incident of your unique position that you alone in the world of today can speak with authority on this point. Your opinion, when you state it publicly,' will, I assure you, make a profound sensation. For the rest, it would be strange, certainly, if the race did not show an improvement. In your day, riches debauched one class with idleness of mind and body, while poverty sapped the vitality of the masses by overwork, bad food, and pestilent homes. The labor required of children, and the burdens laid on women, enfeebled the very springs of life. Instead of these maleficent circumstances, all now enjoy the most favourable conditions of physical life. 
the young are carefully nurtured and studiously cared for, the labour which is required of all is limited to the period of greatest bodily vigour, and is never excessive. Care for oneself and one's family, anxiety as to livelihood, the strain of a ceaseless battle for life, all these influences, which once did so much to wreck the minds and bodies of men and women, are known no more. Certainly, an improvement of the species ought to follow such a change. In certain specific respects, we know, indeed, that the improvement has taken place. Insanity, for instance, which in the nineteenth century was so terribly common a product of your insane mode of life, has almost disappeared, with its alternative, suicide. End of chapter 21